you've been out and about, traveling. Yes, and now I'm here with you. Yes. Whom you joined in marriage 25 years ago. Well, that's not true. What? Well, well, all right. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's nice to see that you've stayed together for 25 years. Yes, we've coped. Sometimes it's been, um, about, as you say, it's hell. And Alice doesn't have anything to grumble about. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Three of our greatest actors are appearing on Broadway in one of the modern dramas, seminal and more offbeat classics. Here to introduce them is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. That offbeat classic, as Susan calls it, is August Strindberg's The Dance of Death. It is a harrowing play about the battle of the sexes. It's been given a great production on Broadway with three top actors, and I'm very happy to have them here tonight. Helen Mirren plays Alice in the play. She's a former actress who has been married to a, um, a military captain whom she is bent on destroying. I'm very happy to have her Alice, here. Alice, not Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alice is bent on destroying. The captain played the poor soul, played by Ian McKellen, who has a few tricks up his sleeve to keep his angry wife at bay. Ian McKellen, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you very much. And into the midst of this rather charming household comes Kurt, who is played by David Strathairn. And he is a, a man who has um, sort of sworn off women and sex and marriage and yet is pulled into this awful marriage and, and I dare say is almost destroyed by these people. David Strathairn, welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, now, when I think of this play, and I think when many people think of The Dance of Death, they don't think of a play with a lot of laughs in it. And yet, in this production, you have managed to find great humor in The Dance of Death. Was this a deliberate attempt on your part to play this for laughs? Oh, I think it's in the play. Mm. It's, it's constructed in the play. Apparently, uh, Ian said that um, when Olivier did it the first time, he, he was surprised at the amount of laughs that there were in it and rather sort of horrified. He thought it was very serious. But I, I find that rather surprising because I, it, it seems to be written comedically. There are a lot of overt comedic lines in it. Well, there certainly are in, the, in this translation. Uh, Richard mm. Greenberg mm. Um, was commissioned by um, uh, Shaw Mathias, our director, to, to do the play. And I, I suppose with an eye on uh, making the play very available to um, a contemporary audience. Mm. And one way he's done that is, is, is by bringing out the, the wit and, and the comedy. And uh, I was a little bit alarmed when, when we read it round us for the first time in the rehearsal room to, to, to realize that almost every other line w was designed to get a laugh and, 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 and the way it was phrased and so on. Mm. A laugh was almost unavoidable. And then uh, realized that it was only 10 years after the first production of this play that uh, Noel Coward wrote Private Lives, oh. another play about a warring couple uh, who fight each other with words and to the great entertainment of the audience, but to the great distress of themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so Strindberg affected Coward as well as so many other uh, subsequent playwrights. And, and the wit, uh, I think, is, is what allows this play to be the surprise uh, success with Broadway audiences. Mm. I think it would be pretty unpalatable if it wasn't funny. Mm. And I think he understood that as the master dramatist that he was. He understood that, you know, that the, the primary, you know, requirement of theater is for the, is, is to keep the audience with you, mm. whether in tragedy or comedy, but to keep them with you, mm. interested in the story. And I, I think this, um, this story would be pretty hard to take if it was just brutal. And what, what, one of the links between uh, uh, Alice and Edgar, well, uh, one of the um, um, their tastes, as it were, that, that's kept, that kept them together for the 25 years of what would otherwise appear to be absolute misery, is their, is their sense of humor. Mm -hmm. They do particularly enjoy uh, laughing at uh, other people's um, misfortunes. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but then the, <laughs> then the audience can find that amusing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that the, the underlying um, message of the play isn't, isn't one of, of, of high seriousness oh, or, or deep tragedy even. Uh, and, uh, it's just the, the, the palatable um, rapping, I think, in mm. which, which the story is told. The way mm. he keeps going back and forth between comedy <laughs> and drama, <laughs> moment by moment in the second act, is reminiscent to me even of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yes. Where, and where you, and you are like the visitor who comes, and, and uh, having this constant edge of laughing and yet such deep 
sadness. Well, mm -hmm. all of those plays, uh, uh, I mean, right up through, as you say, Noel Coward to O'Neill to Albee, I mean, all of our great modern dramatists, they all seem to flow, maybe not so much from Ibsen, but more from Strindberg. We were talking about this before. Do you, do, you've done more modern plays. Do you see the Strindbergian connection through them? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. From the opening line, which is, for me, reminiscent of Endgame, you know, me to play. Mm. And in Endgame, and this one is play for me. I'll use the opening line, and then for like Goodell, the, you know, okay, let's go, and then stage direction by Beckett is they do not move, right? <laughs> and let's exile, let's move on, and then there's so many, so many things that are. And 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 for people who really know their uh, uh, Beckett, they, they they will be intrigued by the fact that at the end of the the, the first act, just before the intermission, one of the characters, Kurt, namely, uh, removes his boots. Ah which happens at the end of the uh, first act of, um, of um, Waiting for Goddard. And I wanted uh, David to leave his boots just a little bit further forward mm -hmm. so yeah. when the curtain came down, they were left there for the <laughs> which also <laughs> that happens. Been, that would have been a very nice touch. But you know, the, the, They'd the, steal them here. Some would take <laughs> yes, them. Yes, they were right. Off. But the, the oh, they don't want these anymore. The desolate landscape of this marriage at times is, and, and the repetitions, as, uh, have you ever noticed, uh, Edgar says to his wife, that we say the same things to each other oh, every right. day? I mean, Beckett was onto that and, and realized that there was a, a, a clue to how human beings survive, but right. also a clue to uh, um, the waste of their lives at the same time and, uh, in, in and the yet, repetition. And yet they have no choice. I mean, the, this play, uh, and like so many of the, the, the modern plays where they say life really is very, very difficult. But you have no choice. You have to go on. And at the end of this play, we'll get to your character in a minute, but you two sort of say, well, just move on. Nothing's going to change. But is there not some dignity in getting on with life, no matter how awful it is, that there's some bravery in keeping to go on rather than killing each other or killing yourself? Well, the big, the big change during the course of the play, part, part of the plot, apart from Kurt's arrival and the way in which uh, um, that injection stirs up their relationship, is, is the fact that Edgar, um, my character, discovers that he's um, dying, mm -hmm. that he has a heart disease, has a series of minor attacks on stage. Um, all of them are medically correct, I can assure you. I've, uh, <laughs> I've had advice on how to do it. But, uh, and that is a huge change for Edgar, his acceptance that he's ill, uh, and what that means to their relationship, and that uh, Alice now can look forward to being his nurse as well as everything else in his life. Uh, Good for her. <laughs> and right. so, so the brave way in which Edgar says at the end of the play, we, we, we'll just forget the past and we'll move on and we'll be happy together, may not chime so chippily with, with, with Alice, who realizes that she, she's going to have to do... Right. Uh, Change the potty. Yes, be extremely <laughs> generous in, in this relationship. So uh, one can't assume that all's going to be uh, roses. I, but I think the brilliant thing that Strindberg does is he leaves, as all I, I think all great playwrights do, they don't tie it all off with a nice big bow and, oh, that's it, done and dusted. It's open-ended, and the audience according to their own particular state of mind or uh, their own experience in life, can take whatever they, particular, they, they can absorb the play and, and um, you know, take their own version of what they feel the play is about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a very, it's an absolute knot of a play. And, and when we were rehearsing it, you know, just to try and work out line by line, almost word by word, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It's not... It's not clear, you know, at all as an actor, and you have to do huge psychological jumps all the time. You're whizzing from one boom to another mm -hmm. attitude to back, and and it's it it was um, it was a very interesting and intense rehearsal period for that reason. Um, but I think that's also the absolute brilliance of the play because it uh, it, it I think it works as much on a conscious level, it, it works on the subconscious level mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other extraordinary and way ahead of his time thing that Stringberg did, was that he um, he accessed the subconscious in the well, ways. Well, yes, we were talking about that earlier, uh, um, uh, David, that, um, I mean, this is pre, pre-Freud, before we have all these ideas about the subconscious, and that this play is coming out of a man who I think was probably insane. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you think? Well, he was uh, he was definitely on a 
a, a quite a few different frequencies and, mm. and, and, and intense ones. Mm -hmm. You know, he was exploring so many different things. So I think just having read his letters and, 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 and searching in the script for some kind of uh, uh, reason to, for these, you know, severe changes, you, you come up with a, this kind of raw psychological explosions that come out from some, you know, very pure place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes it seem heightened and uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, assaulting and very confusing. And, and yet, as we found, if you dig down in there, there's, they're grounded in mm -hmm. something. And it's it, the absolute psychological truth, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, which is yeah. based on his, you know, yeah. uncanny perception of whether he knew it or not, but he was, he was speaking about real stuff, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was from his he own. He was insane, but only insane the way great artists are insane, yeah. though. The an insanity, if you like, of an artist. But I, I was reading that there's going to be an exhibition of his paintings, and I saw one of the books that we had. I didn't realize he was a painter until we... And a philosopher. And, and a photographer. Yes. And I mean, extraordinary. His paintings are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And apparently there's going to be an exhibition of those in, oh, in New York, oh, I heard. Yeah, How do you find um, oh, modern, yeah. modern audiences now respond to this play? I mean, you get the sense there must be a lot of long-suffering married couples coming to see the dance <laughs> of death. Are they frightened by it? Is the laughter a kind of edgy, nervous laughter? Or do they recognize themselves in this play? They're, 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 they're cotton on to the, to the basic relationship between uh, these two on the sixth, sixth line, mm. on yes. the first page. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an enormous uh, laugh, uh, which means it's, it, the audience is at home, it's comfortable, it, it, it understands. Uh, not just from the dialogue of five lines that's preceded it, or, or the look maybe on, on, on both of our faces as we sit up either side of the stage, not really looking at each other, although we're talking to each other. <laughs> uh, yes, they must recognize it, if not in their own lives and in, in, in other <laughs> couples they've <laughs> right. observed. I mean, we've all been mystified, haven't we, as to, as to why certain couples stay together. Mm -hmm. Uh, quarrel as, as, as they do publicly and privately. Uh, but the play is about a, a great deal more than that and, it, and is, is, is uh, I, I, I hesitate to say it's fascinating for any, for any student of modern drama, but it is the case. Uh, it's not often that a, the, a full-blown Strindberg comes your way, uh, or in my experience, and uh, f for those more familiar uh, and with, uh, say, Chekhov and Ibsen, his, his great contemporaries, I I've always thought of them as the two um, twin pillars of 20th century drama mm -hmm. from which everything uh, divides and on which they, everything else hangs. Actually, Strindberg um, could, it could be mm -hmm. claimed as, as superior to either of those mm -hmm. two as, mm -hmm. a, as an influence Beca because, his, because his style was so broad and his interests were so varied and his achievements so uh, so complicated. And that happens even within a play like this, which is very available. Mm -hmm. It's set within a, a naturalistic structure of a, of a story, mm -hmm. uh, which has a beginning, a middle, uh, and, and a, a conclusion. But the way that the story is told at times uh, is, uh, uh, is in front of your eyes experimenting. And, and the, the, there's, there's, there's one scene of, of mime, which no word is spoken, when, uh, when Edgar goes around the house doing various things, each of which has a symbolic importance mm -hmm. to, um, to, You're to lighting the playwright. You're lighting the candles. And Light, lighting candles, destroying things in his life. And, and, and Carrying the cat. What's the symbolic importance of the cat? Well, I, mm. I, I think the cat. <clears throat> You, you I was afraid they were out of food, it's and they, the cat might be dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it's a string bird. They say we have no it's money amazing. left. We have no food. Uh, yeah, I think eat, also the, the play. I you don't, don't know what the cat is. Very... You obviously haven't seen the scene. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I'm backstage. I'm peering through those little holes, trying to see. Um, <laughs> the, the, cat is, the cat is a sign that Edgar is, is responding to something as simple as, as the warmth of life, oh, not necessarily oh, human life. Yes. No. No. And from a cuddle. From, it, <laughs> That's it what I got. From, it doesn't get it from you. But the, 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 uh, just simply responding uh, to, to the warmth of the cat's yeah. fur uh, allows him to play the last scene in which he asks for the I'm warmth of, of, of his dog. wife's uh, yeah. love. I wanted to just uh, quickly ask you, David, your character seems to me, is, is it fair to say that of the three, he, he seems to have the most tragic fate. I mean, he is destroyed by these guys in a way that they 
I don't know if they really have destroyed each other. They sort of made their their peace with each other. But you are really unbalanced when you run out of that out of that house. Mm -hmm. Do you think your character is going to live on and be all right, or have they ruined him? Uh, it's going to be kind of difficult for him to stay on the island. I should instead of running down the rocks, I should just keep going over. Do some operatic end to the sea. Ah! I mean, he's no. kind of like the audience's way into the play on some level, isn't he? He's the stranger coming in to see this, observe this bizarre household. Yeah, he's sort of the chalkboard. You can, you can see what their scratchings will do. And uh, in, in terms of the humor, he probably doesn't have much of a sense of humor and therefore cannot survive in this specific environment. You know, he takes things so seriously and has been so bent on a redemption of himself and, and somewhat a self-righteous, uh, you know, presence enters into this very uh, brutal but skillful and insightful gamesmanship. And he, uh, you know, out of compassion or uh, maybe a sincere hope that he could help these people and by way of paying them back the debt that he owes both of them or something, he loses out because he, uh, he's just not up to their... Uh, their level of war. Their, their their Gr Gr quite early on, Kurt uh, attempts to bring, bring the two warring partners together. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely outraged that he should try and do that. And if, if you've ever been in the middle of a really good argument and some third party comes in and tries to placate, the fact of arguing, yeah. they want an umpire. Well, it's a terrific production of a very um, intense, but we have to say very amusing and witty and sharp play. Uh, wonderful performances by David Strathairn, Helen Mirren, and Ian McKellen. Thank you all for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Susan. His little town blues are melting away. We'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. If we can make it there, we'll make it anywhere. It's up to you, New York, New York. On September 28th, Hundreds of stars of Broadway convened in Duffy Square to shoot that PSA where they celebrate New York and beckon everyone to come back to Broadway. It was choreographed by our next guest and here to introduce him, Michael Riedel. We're joined tonight by Jerry Mitchell. He was able to keep all of those gigantic Broadway egos in line <laughs> in Duffy Square to make that uh, very uplifting <laughs> and wonderful uh, uh, commercial where they all sang New York, New York. Jerry is a leading Broadway choreographer whose credits include The Full Monty, The Rocky Horror Show, and the ever-popular Broadway Bears. Jerry mm. Mitchell, welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, just tell us, how, how much time did you actually have to pull that, uh, that, that, that Duffy Square commercial together? I did it over coffee in the morning just before I got there. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> actually, I was at the uh, Dreamgirls event on Monday, mm -hmm. which was spectacular, and Drew Hodges, who is a great friend in, the, in the an advertising in advertising of yes shows. and he does all the all the advertising for Broadway Bears for free he creates the images for the for the posters and and um, we've worked together for quite a long time and he said I need your help I need your help to choreograph this and I was supposed to have auditions all day long I said whatever you need mm -hmm. I'll be there um, so on Wednesday actually they sent me a tape of the song with a with a big <laughs> map of Duffy Square where each cast was going to stand and I was looking at it I said oh I can't listen to the tape right now because I've got other work that I'm doing I'll listen to it Friday morning oh, it's New York what? New York I, no problem <laughs> you know the lyrics <laughs> so so I put it in and I choreographed it literally over coffee and I got there and I walked into the booth theater and there's everyone I've ever worked with mm -hmm. and everyone I've ever been you know in love with sitting in front of me and I get in the middle of the stage and I say, okay, it's like this, you're going to point. <laughs> if I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. It's up to you. Touch your heart. New York, <laughs> New York. I thought it was marvelous the way you brought in the stars from the booth to Duffy Square and you layered them in. Well, we brought each cast in yeah. one at a time and yes. I had nine assistants with me who are working with me on another project right now. And, and it w I mean, they're, they're dancers, friends of mine, they're all dancers and assistants. So I was lucky. I said, listen, today we're going to take three hours off and we're going to go film a commercial and you're going to help me. <laughs> so I sort of, <laughs> they, were get, they were getting paid for the other job. Thank you, Jay Harris. And <laughs> uh, uh, so um, 
we went down and we did our part and we uh, helped. So layer by layer, you taught As them the, the, the steps. As each cast came in, I threw an assistant. I said, teach them the steps, teach them the steps, teach them the steps. It was tricky. I mean, you know, you got great dancers. Right. Then you have a lot of kids. Then you have great shows. singers who are not dancers. And yeah. the cast had a gobbler. Because I said stars. <laughs> never yeah. done a, right. well, maybe none of them have ever done a musical in their life. And I said, okay, you're going to dance. You had everybody. <laughs> we did. But we had who everybody. Who picked the packing order of who was going to Yeah, be you got a lane stretch and burn up here. Who, how did you decide which ones go in front and those but who you get had, yeah, behind yeah. Well, everybody else? I had nothing to do with that, but, <laughs> but people sort of started to get their own position. They found their own place. <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> the I noticed Elaine was, Stritch was front and center. The funny thing was, in the New York Times picture, I could see so many faces mm -hmm. all the way to the back because yeah, everyone yeah. was on risers. So, mm -hmm. so I thought it was handled amazingly well. And you know what? 500 actors, and they all have egos, and really there was no... None. There you was no problem there. there. I have to say, people were genuinely moved by the whole experience and were having a, a, a really oh, good time. It was, it was amazing. I, I got up at one point on top of Father Duffy. Is yes, that you Father did. Duffy? Yes, it is. And I actually looked at the crowd and I just stood there while they were doing it and I was watching them and I felt, you know, I've lived in New York for 20 years and I think this was definitely a moment that I will never forget in my entire life. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely breathtaking to watch all those people do that. Well, I've got you here onto your uh, for-profit work, uh, <laughs> <laughs> such as the uh, the Full Monty and, um, and and the Rocky Horror Show. You have um, you really come into your own in the last uh, couple of seasons as one of the, um, as I said at the introduction, one of the leading choreographers. Where do you think now choreography on Broadway? is going. I mean, we, we seem to have gotten past the big Lloyd Webber, Macintosh sung through shows where there was not a lot of dancing. Are we getting back to a more dance-driven kind of Broadway musical with you and Susan Stroman? Well, I hope, I hope we are. I think that, I think there's three ways to tell a story in a musical. Dance, singing, and the written word. Mm -hmm. And I think in a musical you'd be silly to eliminate any of them. So, that's what a musical is about, mm -hmm. is about the opportunity to tell the story three different ways. I think a lot of people don't, not a lot of people, I think some people aren't aware that dance can tell a story. And like you said, during that period, there were a lot of shows that didn't take the opportunity to tell a story through dance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that was because necessarily the shows that were written. I think dance is a very sexual sort of, uh, art form. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, dance can be extremely sexy and Broadway Bears, but but uh, everything, contact and now thou shall not, other things that Stroh's doing and, and other people are doing. And I think when the AIDS crisis hit, I think people got, fr got frightened. Mm, and I think there's a little bit of connection there. I was doing a musical called Scandal with Michael Bennett mm. at the time. And it was his last musical, and I was in it, and I was also associate choreographer with Danny Herman and Jody Mocha. We were working, all working on the project together, and Bob Avian was there. And um, you know, it was the wrong time to do that musical because it was all about sex, it was about and sex the dancing scandal, yeah. was completely sexual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that was a period that people got a little frightened of all of that. And now I think people are living with the AIDS crisis, it certainly isn't gone away, it's certainly still a big problem, and it's something that Broadway Cares works on very hard, and I, I, I also support them and work hard at it too, but I think we've found a way to live with it, and now we're trying to say, okay, it's all right to relate physically to one another again. Well, you've done that with a full Monty. I and mean, that, you know, they well, take their clothes off there. <laughs> yes, they do, but the show, the show, that's like, you know, I mean, that show, absolutely, you know, that's certainly part of what that show is, but, you know, the Michael Jordan ball number at the end of the first act, those guys are dressed in sport clothes right. and they're just yeah. playing with an imaginary ball. But yet dance is telling the story. It's telling you the story that these guys are going to learn to strip right. by pretending to play basketball. And that's what theater allows you to do in dance. Theater allows you to take dance and tell a story, and it isn't often written into the script. So what I find is I find that I'm, I'm really excited about the projects that are coming up and the directors that I'm working with, the people that I'm working with, because they are interested in having the story told through dance. And dance being an important component now yes. of a musical yeah, theater Yeah, absolutely. Again. Well, dance makes an audience go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. It just can make all those hairs stand up on the back of your head when it's exciting. And that great tradition of Jerome Robbins and Michael Bennett, Bob oh, Fosse and Tommy Toon, comes Jerry yeah. Mitchell. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure Thank seeing you. you. Thank you. Great to be here.
promise us you'll come back. I would love to. All right, so we close now with Jerry Mitchell and a cast of hundreds on Duffy Square singing New York, New York. Good night. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Lucille Lortel Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk in the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.